Hello and welcome to my channel Happy Learning to You, your ultimate guide to easy learning. The topic for today is the living world and here we are going to discuss about what is living, diversity in the living world, taxonomic categories and the taxonomical aid. So what do you mean by living? Now to define living, we look for the distinctive characteristics which are exhibited by living organisms. This includes growth, reproduction, metabolism and the ability to sense environment. So first characteristic of living organisms is that they all living organisms grow. This means that there is increase in mass and increase in the number of individuals. Unicellular and multicellular organisms grow by cell division. In plants, growth by cell division occurs throughout their lifespan, whereas in animals, this growth occurs only up to a certain age. But cell division may occur in certain tissues to replace the lost cells. Now, if increase in body mass is considered as growth, then non-living organisms like mountains, boulders and sand mounds also grow. This is because of the accumulation of material on surface which leads to this growth. Thus, living organisms show growth from inside, whereas non-living organisms like mountains, boulders and sand mounds show growth from outside, which is a result of accumulation of material on surface, and dead organisms show no growth. Therefore, growth cannot be considered as a defining property of living organisms because non-living organisms also show growth, although the growth is external. So let's come to the second characteristic of living organisms that is reproduction. Multicellular organisms undergo asexual reproduction as well as sexual reproduction whereas unicellular organisms like bacteria, amoeba or unicellular algae, their reproduction is synonymous to growth that is there is increase in the number of cells. Now certain organisms like mules, sterile worker bees and infertile humans do not undergo reproduction and non-living objects cannot reproduce or replicate by itself. A sexual reproduction. Fungi may multiply and spread easily by pro producing millions of asexual spores. Planaria or flatworms, they show true regeneration wherein the fragmented organism regenerates the lost part of its body which in turn becomes a new organism. Lower organisms such as yeast and hydra, they reproduce by budding and fragmentation is also a mode of asexual reproduction in case of fungi, filamentous algae and the proteinema of algae. Now, therefore reproduction again cannot be considered as a defining property of living organisms because certain living organisms like mules, sterile worker bees and infertile humans, although they are living, they do not undergo reproduction. The third characteristic of living organisms is metabolism. All living organisms are made up of chemicals which are being constantly made and changed into biomolecules as a result of chemical or metabolic reactions. All your living organisms, whether they are unicellular or multicellular, plants, animals, microbes and fungi, they all exhibit metabolism. Non-living objects show no metabolism but isolated metabolic reactions outside the body occurs in cell free systems which are performed in test tubes which are neither living nor non-living. Now since metabolism has no exception cellular organization is a defining property of living organisms. This means only and only living organisms are capable of showing metabolism. And the fourth characteristic of our living organisms is the ability to sense their surroundings. All living organisms from prokaryotes to eukaryotes can sense their surroundings or environment through the sense organs and in turn respond to these environmental stimuli which could be either physical, chemical or biological. Since all living organisms can sense and respond to surroundings, Consciousness, again, is a defining property of living organisms. Next, we come to the topic diversity in living world. Now, there are a wide variety of living organisms around us, be it be potted plants, insects, birds, our pets, or other plants or animals. Or, there are several organisms that are not visible to naked eye. 
Because each different kind of plant, each different kind of animal, and each different kind of organism represents species. There are nearly 1.7 to 1.8 million species which are known and described, and this refers to as biodiversity, which can be defined as the number and types of organisms which are present on Earth. Now, plants and animals are known by different names locally, even within the same country. Therefore, to standardize the naming of living organisms, such that the particular organism is known by the same name all over the world, there is a process called nomenclature. But correct naming is possible only when the organism is described correctly, and this is known as identification. Now, each organism is assigned a scientific name which will be acceptable to biologists all over the world. Each organism will have only one name all over the world and this name will not be used for any other known organism. So it will be unique to each organism. For plants, this naming is done as per the International Code for Botanical Nomenclature and for animals, the naming is done as per the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. So the generic name plus the specific epithet give rise to binomial nomenclature. Now this nomenclature has certain universal rules which have to be followed by biologists all over the world so that there is uniformity in naming. So let's look at each of these rules. Biological names are in Latin and written in italics irrespective of its origin. The first word of the biological name is the genus and the second word is the specific epithet. Both the words are separately underlined or printed in italics. The first word starts with a capital letter and the specific epithet starts with a small letter. The name of the author appears after the specific epithet and is always abbreviated. Now, so to understand these rules better, let's take an example. The example here is of mango whose scientific name is Magnifera indica Len. So if you apply the rules here, they are in Latin. The first word that is Magnifera is the genus and the second word that is Indica is the species. The first word starts with a capital letter that is M and the second word starts with a small letter that is I of Indica. And it was first described by Linnaeus, hence the word Lin after the specific epithet. So it becomes Magnifera Indica Lin. Now, living organisms are grouped into convenient categories called taxa, which are based on some easily observable characters. This is known as classification. So dogs, cats, mammals, wheat, rice, plants, animals, each of these represents a taxa. But we have to note that dogs ultimately come under mammals, which do come under animals. Thus dogs, mammals and animals will represent taxa at different levels. Now, before going forward, there are certain terminologies which we have to understand. The first terminology is taxonomy, which is a process of classifying living organisms into different taxa, that is classifying them into different categories based on the external and internal structure, the development process, and ecological information of organisms. Next terminology is systematics which is the study of different kind of organisms, their diversity and the relationship among themselves. The word systematics is derived from the Latin word systema, which means systematic arrangement of organisms. The third topic to be discussed here is taxonomic categories. The lowermost category is the species, which is followed by genus. Then we have family, order, class, phylum or division and the topmost category is the kingdom. Now we have to note here that as we go higher from species to kingdom, the number of common characteristics among the organism goes on decreasing. So the species will have the maximum number of common characteristics among the organisms, whereas the, in the kingdom there are least number of common characteristics among the organism. So now let's discuss each of this in detail starting with the species and genus. So what do you mean by species? It is a group of individual organisms which have fundamental similarities in their morphological characters. Whereas the genus is a group of related species which has more characters in common than the species of other genus. Here we have examples 
Magnifera indica, where Magnifera is the genus and indica is the species. Next we have potato, whose biological name is Solanum tuberosum, where Solanum is the genus and tuberosum is the species. Now the Solanum genus includes other species also, that is nigrum and melongena. Thus it becomes Solanum nigrum and Solanum melongena. Another example is of humans, that is Homo sapiens, where Homo is the genus and sapiens is species. Last example we have is Panthera leo, which is lion, where Panthera is the genus and leo is the species. Again, the Panthera genus may include Tigris species and the Pardus species, where Tigris is for tiger and Pardus is for leopard. Next, we have family, which is a group of related genus, which has still less number of similarities as compared to genus and species. An example under the plant family for plants is the Solanaceae family, where this includes Solanum genera, Petunia genera, and the Datura genera. An example for animals is the Phalidae family, which includes the Panthera genera and the Phallus genera. Order Order is an assemblage of families which exhibit a few similar characters. An example for plants is the Polymonials order, which includes the Convolvulaceae family and the Solanaceae family. Example for animals is the Carnivora order, which includes the Phalidae family and the Canidae family. Then we have the class, which includes related orders. Example is the Mammalia class, which includes the Primata order and the Carnivora order. So monkey, gorilla, gibbon, they come under the primata order, whereas tiger, cat and dogs come under the carnivore order. But all six of these, they come under one class that is mammalia. Next we have phylum or division. In case of plants, classes with few similar characters are assigned to the higher category, which is division. In animals, it is phylum. Example is the phylum caudata which includes fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals. Because all of these have common features like the presence of notochord and dorsal hollow neural system. And the topmost category is the kingdom. We have only two kingdoms, that is animalia, which includes all the animals, and the kingdom plantae, which includes all plants. And the final topic here is the taxonomical age. Now the taxonomic studies of various species of plants, animals and other organisms are useful in agriculture, forestry, industry and in knowing our bioresources and their diversity. But the studies require correct classification of organisms and correct identification of organisms, which in turn requires intensive laboratory and field studies. The collection of actual specimen of plants and animal species is very important and is the prime source of taxonomic studies and for training in systematics. So therefore biologists have established certain procedures and techniques in order to store and preserve the information and specimens of plants and animals using the following aids. So the first aid here is herbarium which is a storehouse of collected plant specimens which are dried, pressed and preserved on sheets which in turn are arranged as per universally accepted system of classification. The specimens along with their description on herbarium sheets is a storehouse or repository for future use. They are labeled with information about the date and place of collection. They are English, local and botanical names, family, collector's name and various other details. So herbarium is exclusively for plant specimens which are dried. Next we have botanical gardens. These specialized botanical gardens have collections of living plants for reference. So this is the basic difference between botanical gardens and herbarium because botanical gardens include living plants. The plant species are grown for identification purposes. And each plant is labeled indicating its botanical or scientific name and its family. Some famous botanical gardens are at KEW England, Indian Botanical Garden Howrah and at National Botanical Research Institute Lucknow. Next we have museums which are set up in educational institutes like schools and colleges and have collection of preserved plants as well as animal specimens for study and reference. 
Now here the specimens are preserved either in containers or jars in preservative solutions or as dried specimen. The insects are collected, killed, pinned and then preserved in special insect boxes. Larger animals like birds and mammals are stuffed and preserved and the museums also include animal skeletons. Next taxonomical aid is the zoological parks. These are the places where wild animals are kept in protected environments which are similar to their natural habitats under human care in order to learn about their food habits and behavior. So these zoological parks are for animals. Next we have keys which are used for identification of plants and animals based on the similarities and dissimilarities based on contrasting characters which are generally in a pair called couplet. So keys basically represents a choice which is made between two options wherein one is accepted and the other is rejected. Some other aids include flora which gives the actual account of the habitat and the distribution of plants of a given area. We also have manuals which helps in the identification of names of species in an area. Also, we have monographs and finally the catalogs. So this is all we have under the topic living world and the taxonomical aids here. Thanks for watching and do subscribe to my channel for more educational videos. Thanks a lot.